Well, again, thank you all for, for, for being here uh, today. I think we are about ready to get things underway. And our, our first speaker today is the editor of the Cannon Falls Beacon. In fact, he is the fifth generation of his family to edit the newspaper. Uh, the Beacon's been in existence since uh, 1876. Uh, also, he is the current vice president of the Minnesota Newspaper Association. Uh, would you please welcome Mike Dalton? Mike, it's all yours. Oh, you do. <laughs> there you all right. Well, good morning, everybody. Rod just kind of took my first five minutes of my speech away with some of that history. So, um, uh, before we get going, I just want to say that uh, that this is. It's kind of difficult for a newspaper guy to sit here in front of a group of people because we are used to telling your stories in our newspaper. And very rarely do we talk about ourselves. Um, so you just kind of have to bear with me as, as we go along. Uh, my mother's here, and uh, I'll thank her. Without her, I wouldn't be here. So, uh, <laughs> so with that, we'll get going. A um, little brief information about myself. I was born in 1965 here in town. I was a Williams baby. I uh, grew up in Cannon Falls, graduated from the high school here in 1984. I went to college at Mankato State University. Um, it's not Minnesota State University in Mankato. To me, it's Mankato State University. Graduated in 1890, or 18. <laughs> See? <laughs> I know. Uh, good. I actually, <laughs> yeah, well, there's my jeans right there. I'll, I'll thank her again for that. Yeah, no, I graduated in 1989 with a degree in English education. Um, kicked around, substitute taught for quite a while. Uh, back in those times, uh, the education budgets were being slashed throughout the state, and I was not able to secure a full-time job in this area, which is where we wanted to stay. Um, I married my wife, Mary, in 1988. She's the daughter of, of Richard Carlson, Dick Carlson, who ran the grocery store here in town for a number of years. We married in uh, 1988, moved back to town. Uh, I have two kids, Ethan, who's in college in Minneapolis, and Emma, who's a junior here at Cannon Falls. So as Rod alluded to, the Beacon uh, started in 1876. It was started by a gentleman named John Leonard. Um, Marv Nelson knows him personally. Um, My great-great-great-grandfather, S.S. Lewis, Silas Lewis, uh, came from Iowa to Minnesota by train, landed in Northfield, walked over to Cannon Falls, and purchased his share in the Beacon in 1880. So uh, it's been in the Dalton family, or the Lewis family, uh, in one shape or another since 1880. Um, I was thinking last night with the demise of, of Schofields, that now we might be the longest tenured business in town. I don't know if there's any other businesses that have been around for that long, and, and we really appreciate that fact that we've been able to stick around that long. Um, S.S. Lewis had four kids, Don, Lucretia, uh, Murdy, and Edith. Uh, my great-great-aunt, I think, was Lucretia. Some of you may remember her. Uh, she was quite the lady. Um, S.S. died around 1938 or 39, and in 1940, then the newspaper went to his four kids. And his son, Don, uh, being the son, I, I guess kind of assumed that he was the big guy in charge now that S.S. was gone. And from what we've been able to gather, kind of started looking at the beacon as his own uh, little bank, little deposit. And he started taking money out of, the, out of the business. And the girls were not very happy about that, so they took him to court back in 1940, and they won. Uh, so Don ended up kind of being an outcast. Around that time, Lucretia took over. She was a school teacher by trade, so she was the logical of the three sisters to, to start running the beacon. Um, Don was kind of cast aside, as I said. One of her sisters uh, was Edith, who married a Rosing, who had a daughter named Lib, Elizabeth, who married a Schellenbarger. And so we are uh, related to John Schellenbarger, who's still in town. Some of you may know John. Um, so Lucretia took over as editor, and she ran a newspaper till about 1962, 63, when my dad came into the business. Um, Lucretia came in, and Dick had the business for a year or two, and she really didn't quite know what kind of job he was doing. She wasn't, I don't know, those of you who remember Lucretia could probably understand. 
Um, so she threatened to sell her half of the beacon, in fact, put advertisements in the Minneapolis newspapers, uh, selling a half interest in the Cannon Falls beacon because she was not happy with the way Dick was running things. Uh, nothing ever came of it. Uh, she lived to be 102, maybe. Uh, but, but Dick was cruising along as editor starting in 1963, like I said. Uh, many of you know he had a, an accident in 2012. Um, and that's when I took over as editor. Dick still comes in to the office every day, comes in in the morning, uh, opens our mail, bosses us around, throws out suggestions, uh, and uh, goes to coffee every morning. So we're glad he's, he's still around. Um, the Beacon used to be located on Mill Street, above where Bob Brittnall has his insurance uh, agency. In fact, we've got pictures from there of SS and uh, probably one of his printers um, in, the, in the window there. Then the Beacon moved to the basement of what the uh, Cannon Realty is now. Uh, and at the time we were there, that was Cardis's department store. Um, and then we moved to our, to our current location. I uh, failed to mention my grandfather, George, who I'm, I'm sure many of you know too. He, he came into the business around, oh, the 1930s again. So he was there for all the turmoil, but he was a printer. Uh, and he was pretty content to just sit down in the basement and, and do his printing and kind of leave things to Lucretia and Dick to battle it out. Um, but he did write a column that, that appeared every week, could be column, which I've now taken over and write occasionally. Um, so yeah, five generations. Um, I don't know that there'll be a sixth. Um, the newspaper business uh, is an interesting one to be in right now. Uh, we're fighting the internet, of course. We're fighting Washington, uh, certain people there that have kind of taken the newspaper credibility to task. Uh, so whether, or I don't think, I don't think that, uh, that the fake news things that we hear uh, really affect a community newspaper as much as they do some of the big ones. Uh, at the Beacon, we consider ourselves the kind of the historians of the town, I guess you could say. Uh, so we we put in the people who die and the people who are born, um, people who get married, people who get engaged, people who go to jail. So I think that the co the community newspaper will always have a spot. Now, whether or not there'll be advertising revenue to keep paying for the newspaper to be there, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I'm sure we all know that downtowns are shrinking, businesses are consolidating. Um, it's made it a little bit tougher in our business, but uh, there's just always will be a need for the community newspaper like we have. You won't find uh, adventures and learning in the Minneapolis newspaper when you get it on a Monday morning. You won't find that uh, uh, the, the CCIC is having a community dinner on Sunday at the Episcopal Guildhall. Uh, you know, you won't, you won't see those in the Republican Eagle or the Post Bulletin or the Tribune, uh, that kind of stuff. So there'll always be that spot for us. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of uh, keeping our heads above water. Uh, the Internet has been a blessing for all of us. We all love the Internet. It's kind of hurt our business. Um, the internet is kind of tailor-made for certain businesses that we used to rely on for revenue, like car dealers. I mean, the internet's a great place to go. You can search and do all that kind of stuff. And then our classified ad section is way, way down uh, with Craigslist and the Facebook for sales and all this kind of stuff. I keep saying the internet's a fad that's going away, but I'm not sure it's ever going to. Uh, but it's also helped us. A lot of our news releases used to come in typewritten or handwritten. Now people will email them. So it's helped us, I think, as much as it's, it's hurt us. Um, problem with a community newspaper and the internet is that it's virtually impossible for a newspaper our size to make money on the internet. Some of the big newspapers have all the views and impressions and they get paid by Google and all this kind of stuff and, and we are lucky to make enough money digitally to, to keep our presence on the web. So um, that, that's one of the battles that a smaller newspaper fights is the, the, the internet revenue. Um, we've, we hear about the fake news that I alluded to earlier. Um, we don't publish national news. 
in the Beacon. I don't think that's the place to go to read it. Um, I think if you want your national news, you'll read the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press or whatever. If you want to hear what your neighbor's up to or how your, how your ball team did Friday night, you'll read us. Um, I think with, we've been accused in the past of picking and choosing what we print. <laughs> um, but, but that's not true. If it's news, we'll print it. Uh, we've, lost, we've lost advertisers over the years because of some of the stories that we've written. We've lost subscribers over the years uh, for stories that we've written. Um, people are very passionate in their beliefs. Um, I know we, we ran a story, I don't know, three or four years ago when Ken Crescent first started his protesting, he was at the Catholic, on the Catholic Church sidewalk, and there was, a, bunch, there was a, a number of members of that church that were offended that we ran that story, and we had about 12 people cancel their subscriptions because of the story that we ran. Most of them eventually come back, um, but, but we, don't, we don't like to see anybody leave, of course, but by the same token, we can't shy away from what's happening in our community because that's our job, to report what's happening in our community. Um, we get a lot of calls about the police report. Keep my name out of the police report. Well, we always tell them the easiest way to keep your name out of the police report is, of course, <laughs> don't do anything to get in the police report. Um, we've been accused over the years of taking people's names out of, of the police report. In our family is Exhibit A that we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we always tell people whatever we get from the police department is what goes in our police report. So if you have anybody complaining to you about their name being in or, or whatever, or they didn't put so-and-so's name in and they put my name in, that's, that's not true. We, we publish just about everything. Um, a, a typical week for us at, at the office We'll, uh, we'll get together on a Monday morning, we'll kind of rehash things that, that happened over the weekend. We've got a list of, of story ideas that we keep. Uh, some we get to right away, some are urgent, some with dates on them uh, will be prioritized over, uh, you know, somebody who has a great collection of cookie cutters. Um, still a great story to tell, and we love telling those kind of stories, feature stories. Uh, people love to read them. But, uh, some, but we have to prioritize. We get together on Mondays. It's myself and a gentleman named Ken Haggerty who produced most of the news. Uh, we're always, always, always looking for ideas, for story ideas. I, I mean, there's nothing that... Uh, we had a great two-part story this week and last week on Sandy Walschlager who took a, a horseback riding trip through Arizona and she just sent that to us. She thought, hey, maybe people might enjoy reading this, and she sent it to us, and it ended up being wonderful. Um, everybody's got a story to tell, kind of is what we say. Uh, a lot of people are just too shy to, to tell them or don't think it's a big deal or, or whatever, but, man, those stories are so cool to read. Um, Rosie over here at the table, she does a fantastic job. She brings a little, a little quirkiness to our operation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we love it. It's great. It's just one other facet of a, of a newspaper. Um, the columnists and, and opinions. I'm sure uh, you all read our letters to the editor. Most people check that, that part out first thing. And I'll admit, it's been a little boring lately. I'm going <laughs> to do what I can to stir things up a little bit. Because um, uh, people do, they turn to that um, and check that out probably the first thing. But uh, back to the feature stories, really, if you have a story to tell, please let us know. I mean, we can't report anything if we don't know about it. That's the only way that, 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 we, can, that we can do that. Um, I don't know. I don't really have anything else planned. Yeah, you got a question? <laughs> I don't know if anybody heard that, but Jean said that she doesn't have a subscription because she can't wait for it to come out, so she comes by and picks it up. And, and there's, uh, if you ever drive by the Beacon on a Wednesday, you'll see that there are cars parked out front. We have people that circle the block because we, we put a little sign in our window that says the Beacons are not here yet. And, and we'll have people circle the block a couple times waiting for that to come out of the, out of the window. And we love it. I mean, it, what could be better for a business than to have people want to read your product or, or use your product? Um, yeah, Joyce. Uh, 
we. Yep. It has been a while since we've done that. Um, uh, I, it's hard to find people that are willing to go up to a stranger on the street and just say, <laughs> you know, what do you think of the present administration? And so that's where we've kind of run into some problems with that. Is we just don't have a, we just don't have anybody that, that has the guts to do it. Um, but yeah, that, that's a. We, we probably should. We probably should get more. Any way that we can get interaction with the community, we feel, is to our benefit. Um, you see a lot of pictures of kids in our paper because, I mean, that one, you know, of course, they're, the kids are our future and all that stuff, but from our perspective, the more faces and the more names we get in our newspaper, the more people who are going to want to read it. Um, so we, during school especially, we have a heavy emphasis on, on the schools. Um, they do a lot of cute things. They, they lend themselves to a lot of great pictures. Uh, but that would be a great way to get more people, and I'll see if I can find somebody who's willing to do it. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> um, so no, I, like, like I said, I don't have a whole lot more uh, newspaper-wise. Um, I was talking to Rod earlier, and I don't think I'm out of bounds by doing this, but um, I, I took the plunge last fall, and I ran for the, for the city council, and I was fortunate enough to be elected. So it's kind of an interesting... Um, a newspaper guy who's involved in government it's been very interesting uh, it's been very it's been a kind of a kind of a tough tightrope to walk because I, I I learned things and I've heard things at the city level that a newspaper guy believe it or not even here in Pistol Rapids things happen um, that a newspaper guy would just drool to put on his front page and of course I can't because violations of data practices and all that kind of stuff but I'll just throw it out to you folks, too. If you have any questions about the, the, the city or if you have any suggestions or, or whatever, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm downtown and, and always willing to listen to, to anybody. So uh, I didn't think I had an hour planned, Rod, and I was right. Mike? Yeah. It didn't take long for a letter to the editor that supported you that after you were elected that he's sorry to be sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Rosie's right. Um, who who are you referring to? I don't remember that. And uh, but the other thing is, uh, years ago, after I moved here from the cities, people asked me why, how I could think of moving to a small town because there weren't many people to write up. I was a city reporter. I said, well, there's a couple thousand people that each have a story. They each have at least fifteen stories. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just awesome. Hmm. It's called ripples, which is the ripple effect of when you see something good happen. And then it's, it almost gives us permission to do nice things. Mm -hmm. But I've even got next week's people have told me they may not want their name in there, or you know the other person may not. But I vetted them, so okay, they're, <laughs> they're okay. And and but it, it's an idea. Oh gosh, yeah, it's okay to do good things. That's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's the Scandinavian upbringing that we have around here, but it seems like people are almost, uh, I wouldn't use the word ashamed, but it's like a lot of people don't think that they deserve to be in the newspaper. They don't deserve the recognition for the things that they've done. And Rosie started the, the Ripples column, which uh, I believe came out of the sainted and tainted in the Pioneer Press, if you've ever read that on Saturdays, where people will just write in and, but we're only doing sainted. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's a great it's a it's a especially with everything that, that comes out nationally about you know everything that you read in the Minneapolis papers doom and gloom and all this kind of stuff. It's really nice to have a bright spot, a bright column in our paper for people to read that there are people out there doing good things, whether or not they want to be named or recognized. You know, we'll, we'll go ahead and throw it out there anyway. Um, I think Rosie might be a little overextended right now. Uh, the, the funny thing with me is that in hometown, junior high school, the assistant principal came to me because I wanted to be a journalist. And he said, you shouldn't be a journalist because you're too shy. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe shy people can feel things. About, you know, maybe there's a place for us. So uh, that's why I, I really have a hard time going <laughs> Yeah. So when you had that column before, a good place to interview people was Econo Food. 
Because mm -hmm. I came out with my groceries going to the car and somebody pushes a microphone at me. And says, what do you think about this or that? That was fun. I enjoyed it. You know, so, maybe, so maybe you're the one, maybe you're the one to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll kick that around at the office again about doing it. But you're right, a count of foods on a Wednesday would be perfect, wouldn't it? We might get run over. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in 1876, you, uh, your paper must have used letter type and some really basic ways of printing. I would be interested in what you've seen over the years in the technology in producing the paper we have today. Okay. No, he's right. Back in 1876, uh, everything was hand was hand set. They ended up coming with an invention called the linotype, which uh, was a big electric smoky machine that would make lead. Uh, you'd type it in on a linotype, and the lead would the, the, the liquid lead would f go into forms, and it would create your words. You take each one of these little blocks about yay big, and you'd put them all in the row that you wanted them to be. You'd lock it in and then the sheets would run over the top with the ink. And we used to have that in our basement. Um, I mentioned John Schellenbarger. He, he likes to tell a story one time where he had a, probably a full page worth of text and, and everything, and he didn't lock it tight enough. And as he was walking it to the press, he stumbled a little bit, and the whole page went all over the floor. So, I mean, you can imagine what Legos are like on your floor to have all these little pieces of, of lead type. Uh, then the typesetting. Uh, we, uh, another thing came along called the CompuGraphic, uh, which Kathy has spent some time in front of. And that you, you'd put a sheet of paper up in front of you. You know, when you type on a computer screen now, you see the words as they come across, and, and a lot of it will auto, you know, correct. But you can see if you've misspelled a word, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can't see that on a CompuGraphic. You're just kind of going blind. So you'd, you'd develop the CompuGraphic, and then you'd look at it, and if you had a mistake, You'd have to go back and retype it and fix it. Now everything, you know, you just see it on the screen. But um, printing presses now, we print our newspaper in Northfield at Cannon Valley Printing. We print our shopper in Red Wing at the Republican Eagle. And the presses there are uh, anywhere between a million and two million dollars. Um, you know, the paper comes in the big rolls, they go, they can change it as it's moving. So if you're getting down to a, a small roll of paper, I don't know how they do it. I've never gone over to their watch, but they can web it in as the machine is working so they don't have to stop. Um, we used to, I mean, there's no way, it's a consortium of, of printers. There's no way one, some, you know, our size could, could ever do that. But technology-wise, uh, the computers have, uh, it's just, you, you can't even describe how much it's changed in the last 20 or 30 years. We used to do all of our advertising, uh, or when we would create our ads, we'd have little rolls of border tape. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. You'd square it, you'd square it, you'd square it. So you'd make your border with this tape. You'd have to cut it every time. You'd have to find uh, you know, pictures or, or art, cut it out, wax it, paste it on this sheet of paper. Um, now everything's just right there. It's just, you know, Boom. Well, I mean, most of us have used the new computers. It's just Nelson hasn't. He's still on an Apple II. But, uh, <laughs> but you, just take, you just take it and you put it wherever you want to, and it's, it's just amazing. It's cut. So we used to, uh, pagination in our paper used to take sometimes till midnight when we were pasting it all up by hand. Um, first time I ever did it, I was there until 3 in the morning. I got better at it, fortunately. Now we're done by 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's just, it's just amazing. Digital pictures. Um, we've got some older, you know, 35 millimeter cameras at our at our office, and I take my iPhone and I can take a better picture with my iPhone than I can with the $600 camera that we bought have down at the office. It's just amazing, um, and that, that's actually helped with the news delivery because we've every week we'll receive pictures of somebody who maybe drove by. Oh, we've had. Uh, wildlife picture. Somebody sees an eagle sitting in a tree, they'll take a picture, they'll email it to us, boom, it's in the paper that week. Um, yeah, it's just, it, the technology is just incredible. Yeah. yeah. Is there, a way to access old there is. Um, we sell what, what, what we call an e-edition. Um, it's included. 
it's included with a subscription, otherwise it's a, a subscription itself that can access all of our newspapers back to like 2005. Um, that's kind of, that's when we started our online presence. Unfortunately, there's no way to do it online past that. The city had a, had a program when, when Dallas Larson was still here where they took, they took all of our newspapers and they digitized them up until, well, maybe right about that time. But the process they used is not searchable. So you could pull up each page. I mean, it's all there and it's saved somewhere, but you couldn't like, um, you couldn't look up like, uh, like Keith Myers 1996 and have those stories come up. So it's kind of a futile effort. The State Historical Society is trying to get a program going where they're gonna, they want to take all the newspapers and scan them and make them searchable. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if people know this, but by state statute, every newspaper has to send up every newspaper that they, that they print. So every week we send a newspaper to the Minnesota State Histor uh, Historical Society who then keeps it. They've got warehouse after warehouse full of newspapers. So it behooves the State Historical Society to create some sort of digital, you know, just, but they've really, they're really dragging their feet. I don't know, it's, it seems like a great project to me, but they just drag their feet. Can't get, in, can't get them to do anything, so. But we do have everything, of course, at the office. We have all of the, every paper we've ever printed, we have in a bound volume down at the office. And I think the library has microfiche, but I'm not sure. Museum has them bound, yep, yep. And then the library with their microfiche, I don't think it's got current. I don't know if anybody really uses microfiche anymore. Um, but there are some, the older editions are, are available there too. Yeah, yeah. Back to the block type again. Mm -hmm. Do you have wanted posters from 1876? <laughs> uh, and uh, point of information, there's a museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin called the Hamilton Block Type Museum. They have a website, and they have a tremendous display of the wood block mm -hmm. going way back, and they were used for uh, uh, billings for concerts, but also wanted posters. Hmm. So, question, do you have the wanted posters? We don't have any wanted posters. <laughs> Not from 1876, no. We've got some from last week with, with the triad program. <laughs> 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 but no, no. It would be really cool to have. We do have, we've got quite a bit of artifacts at the office, but you know, back when they were creating them back in 1876, they, they never thought that in 19 whatever that they would be really cool to look at, you know? So, um, yeah, I wish, but that's great. I, I, I think I might want to check out that, that museum. Yeah, I mean, we love the, 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 the old type cases and people put little knickknacks on them on their wall and stuff, and, but the, the old block, is uh, is really cool um, if you've never seen them the negatives and all that kind of stuff it's it's a really neat thing to 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 check out so yeah rod yeah can you maybe touch on other things you do besides the beacon i mean i just picked up my passport picture today. <laughs> and being an auctioneer i know you're a big yeah fan boy do we do we love auctioneers <laughs> holy cow <laughs> uh, we've kind of created a, a, a niche uh, business with auction posters so if you if you see, uh, and Rod doesn't create enough posters um, for my liking anyway, but if you, uh, if you, if you see any of the Matt Maring auction or, or Todd Houghton auction, the bills, the big flyers, uh, we've, we print all of, of Dick Houghton's and Matt Maring's flyers, so that's something that we've really tried. We've really tried to broaden our horizons on that, hit, hit some of these, uh, their conventions and, and things like that. But, yeah, uh, Rod's right. The Beacon, our printing department is still really top notch. Um, passport, photos, business cards, letterheads, envelopes. Uh, if you go out to Jim Simon's sale next week, it is it is horse sale. They'll, there's a booklet and we produce those. Um, yeah, really, anything that you'd want printed, we can do, uh, printing wise. And a lot of people don't realize that. It's it's, and that's probably our fault for not marketing ourselves as well as we should, but. We get a lot of people that say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. But yeah, that's the way it is. I want to go back to something Rosie said with, with those letters to the editor. One thing that, that we have to develop in our newspaper business is a thick skin. Um, when we, there's, there's usually two sides to every story, and if we print something, 
we usually we, we always say we do a pretty good job when we have both sides complaining. So you know if you cover a meeting and there's an issue coming up and the fours people get on our case because we were biased towards the other ones and they get on our case because we we're biased towards this one, then we kind of feel like maybe we did our job. We presented it fairly and honestly and we didn't take sides and we just presented it to our readers. But there is one particular gentleman who uh, who's been very interesting to deal with. Um, but yeah, you really have to, because uh, we have to take ownership for everything we print. Um, and a lot, sometimes people don't like what we print and they're, some of them are not shy about letting us know. Um, so that is, that is one thing that, that a newspaper person has to develop a, a very thick skin. We've actually lost people over the years who, who can't handle that, who, who just can't take criticism and can't take what at times can be very personal criticism, but I think it's just part and parcel with the job. So, Rosie has another question, yes. thankfully. Yeah, that's, you know, we can't pick and choose what other people do. Um, if, if somebody breaks the law or gets caught doing something they shouldn't be, it's, it's news and it needs, to be, it needs to be reported on regardless of who it is. Um, so that is, that is one of the downfalls of having uh, such close ties to the community, I think, is that you run a very big risk of, of, of losing friends, of making people angry. We actually kind of like the bigger newspapers um, to break some of our stories because then we can just say, oh, we're just reprinting what they did. We didn't, you know, <laughs> right? Yep, so, so on a lot of things we'll know and it's just uh, almost too sensitive for us to get into. Uh, so we'll just let the Republican Eagle break the story and then we'll report on it from there, but it doesn't happen very often. So. <laughs> yeah, right. You mentioned again the internet is affecting the newspaper business, all kinds of But as vice president of the Newspaper Association of Minnesota, is that something the association is always, I would think, looking at? Um, yes and no. Our, our, our association is made up of one of, the, one of the things that's happened in the newspaper business. Um, there's really three. I think there's there's really like three different groups that control probably 90% of the newspapers in in the state. We're one of the very very few independent newspapers, family owned, that are not owned by some big conglomeration. So there's a group out of Adams Publishing um, owns probably 120 different community newspapers in the state. Uh, Red Wing is owned by Forum Communications out of Fargo. They probably own 100 newspapers in the state. So there's so much, there's so much heads and tails above everybody else because they've got these great big deep pockets that they can dip into. So the disparity is something that we talk about quite a bit. Um, but you know, the internet is just one of those things that we've all had to accept is coming. Um, cable TV was going to ruin the the newspaper business, um, you know, satellite TV was going to ruin the newspaper business. The n internet was going to ruin the newspaper business, and it, and it hasn't. We've been resilient. Um, 
but I, but I think that the, uh, the big companies buying all of the newspapers has really been a big issue. Um, you, you, when you've got, like the Red Wings who have, they could have 100 reporters at their disposal to cover a certain story. They, you know, they're owned by, uh, by this group and if there's a big breaking story, they might have four reporters and photographers covering it. We might have one guy with an iPhone and a pad and a pencil. Uh, so it's hard to compete with that kind of stuff. Um, but the, at, the, at the association level, our biggest thing right now is uh, public notices. I know you see in the back of our newspaper, we run the legals. Uh, Legals talk about meetings that are coming up. They talk about hearings that are coming up. Um, and a lot of the municipalities, of which I guess I'm part of now, want to see that stuff taken out of the newspapers and posted on the line and stuff like that. Well, uh, we look at it as, I mean, that's how you people know, or, and, and we know that there might be a hearing coming up on, on a street assessment. Uh, and if, a, if you trust the government, to put it on their web page in a timely fashion, chances are you're never going to see it because they'll they'll pull every. Uh, I hope the mayor's not listening to this, but uh, you know they'll pull every trick in the book they can not to have to pay to get this stuff out there. So we're really we're really fighting a fight to keep legal notices in in uh, in newspapers. That's that's the biggest thing right now because the counties and the cities don't want it in in the newspaper. One I think. For lack of transparency, they don't want people necessarily to know what's going on. And then two, uh, just because of the cost, which is actually pretty minimal when you look at it. So one of the big fights we're fighting, and I'll just say this, is, is uh, uh, the go uh, like uh, property, unclaimed property. The state has like $700 million worth of unclaimed property in their coffers right now, and they use it to balance their budget. So we're fighting to get, and every now and then you'll see in our paper a list of people with unclaimed property. And they don't want to have to publish that in a newspaper because they don't want to have to give it back. It's basically it in a nutshell. So we're fighting at the legislature to force them to run notices, if, at least in the, like the bigger daily newspapers. So that's, I mean, just one little thing that the newspapers are out in front trying to get you your, your money back. $700 million in their coffers and they don't want to give it back. So, so you know, that's kind of, transparency is kind of the fight that, as an association, we try to continue. Marv, you got a question? Yeah. I just wanted to comment, and I know this really dates me, but the internet, yes, it's been a wonderful thing, but I am of the age where I still like to read a newspaper and a book in my hand. And the young people, everything online, and, and it kind of really breaks my heart to see that. I mean, I like computers, but I'm not going to sit there and read all this stuff. <laughs> One thing, it's hard on my neck and my eyes, but it, it's, it's, a, it's changed. But it's hard for me to accept that because <laughs> I love to hold that in my hands and read it. So it's kind of a good thing and maybe not such a good thing. Yeah. Um, the, the people in this room are great newspaper readers. It's when you get to people younger than me, younger than Keith, that are doing all that kind of stuff, and how do you get them as readers of your newspaper? Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the huge, uh, one of the big battles that we fight, how to attract younger readers. Um, and we've, We've thrown some things out there. We've, we've done a series of stories on like where are they now type things where we've gone with the 20, 30 year old kids. kids, uh, And it just, I don't know, we, we're, we're just at a grasping at straws to how to get that younger generation interested in the print version because we can't, there's no way we could do our newspaper online with the type of ad revenue we get from our digital product. There's just absolutely no way. So, so we have to have that paper product and it's, it's a real struggle. So if anybody has any suggestions on how to get the 20 year old kid to read my newspaper, <laughs> please, please let me know. I can't even get him to talk to us. Uh, that's true. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yep, it's, it's really a way to keep connected to the community in, in which you grew up, I think. And you know, maybe the kids that are into the phones, maybe, maybe someday, maybe sooner or later, they'll, their eyes will go so bad that they have to start reading. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know, as a newspaper, we can, we can only hope that that happens. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll leave you with one little story. When I was in college, uh, I went to Gustavus also for a couple of years, and my roommate was from Omaha, big city. And I had the beacon on my bed, and he was reading through it, and all of a sudden he just busts out laughing. And I'm like, what are you laughing at? You know, kind of, my dad did that paper, why are you? <laughs> and uh, he goes, look at here. There's a, so we had a little story in that said, whoever left the cake pan at Vesa Spring Garden Church, please come pick it up in the, you know, the office. And that was a story that we ran in a newspaper. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that a community newspaper does that your big, that your big metros are never going to do. Um, and he was just, he was just amazed that, that we would put something like that in our paper. But it probably got back to its owner. Yeah, Joyce. I remember uh, Jay Leno would do small yeah. news, and it was really funny, you know, some of the things he had. And I remember years ago on the Beacon, this yeah. one, and this is a long one, probably I'm thinking 1970, something like that, where it, 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 a big news article is a ham fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> <laughs> We actually, uh, we, we, the Beacon actually got on that later on after that because we had a story that said Tuesday Club to meet on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And to us, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Everybody knew what the Tuesday Club was, but to Jay Leno, he, he thought it was funny. Yeah. Yeah, so. Any last questions, suggestions, comments on how we can make our paper better? Okay, Rod, that's all I've got. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Rod. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Give him another round of applause. That was great. Uh, I wanted to mention, too, Mike, I, with three sons in the military, uh, and, and it, I don't know how you do it, but you work it out where you give subscriptions to military VFW. through the VFW, and that's great because I know when they were deployed and wherever they were, they always would get the beacon. They loved it. So that's a, that's a great service that, uh, that they do. The VFW provides it through the beacons. So.